Hi, everyone. Whew, I'm so excited. Um, it doesn't matter how many times I do a talk. I'm always, I always have this, you know, those butterflies telling me, oh, it's going to be okay. So I hope it, it'll be okay and you'll enjoy my talk. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, it's really important for me that you all took the time to listen to what I have to say. And I truly hope you'll enjoy. Uh, okay, let's begin. So yeah, hi, my name is May. I'm a software engineer. I'm a backend developer. And yes, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. For those of you who managed to miss those giant R2-D2 heels, which are both glittery, let me just make a little turn so you can get... Okay, now that we're all on the same page, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm wearing right now, so we can move forward. Um, yeah, so I really have to tell you about my last semester in college. So during that semester, I had 10 courses left to take. And I mean, usually uh, people would take like five or six courses per semester, and well, I had 10. Oh, yeah, I also had to work three times a week. So having to balance between uh, work and college, I had to have the best timetable. And so I want you to show, I want to show you how I was able to construct this timetable. So let's take a look at an example. How would you construct your timetable for a semester? So you start with having the list of courses, and lectures are mandatory, so there's only one option, but tutorials, you can choose from a list which tutorial you want to attend. So let's say we choose uh, the lectures, and like which are mandatory, and then out of the list of tutorials, I chose uh, Sunday, oh yeah, in Israel we go to college on Sunday, That's a working day, that's so weird, right? But our, <laughs> yeah, our day off is Friday. So I always have to mention this when I am abroad. Uh, yeah. So let's say I chose the Sunday morning uh, tutorial um, for calculus and the Tuesday tutorial for assembly. And when I choose the courses that I want to uh, go to, or not the courses, but I mean the classes, then what I want to consider is my own constraints. Uh, which were, at the time, I wanted minimum days at school, which means I don't want to be there if I don't have to. And I wanted to have minimum clashes between classes. I mean, I can't be in two different places at the same time. Um, and also, I wanted to have minimum gap between classes, because I don't want to wait for, let's say, more than one or two hours for a class. Uh, it felt like a waste of time. So considering those constraints, if I go back to what I chose, I see that I kind of violate the minimum clashes between classes constraint. And I mean, it's not really a question about violating it because this is why I decided uh, to go with minimum and not like no clashes. Because sometimes I don't care to miss a part of a course or maybe like the first hour of something. I'll, you know, it'll be okay if I just miss the first hour of calculus, whatever. <laughs> and so this is why it's minimum clashes between classes and not, you know, no clashes at all. So if I will rechoose, now I moved the um, uh, tutorial to be on Wednesday, like the calculus tutorial to be on Wednesday and instead of on Sunday. And this is the first timetable that we get. This looks kind of okay, right? Um, we don't have any clashes at all, so this is good. Uh, let's see uh, the other constraints. So I believe we can do better in terms of amount of times that I have to go uh, to college. I mean, like you saw in the timetable, let's go back for a second. You see over here, I don't want to go just for one class. I mean, it will, it will be time consuming. I have to travel I have, just for one class. That's annoying. And at nine in the morning, I mean, come on. So yeah, so let's try that again. Uh, let's try to rechoose and move uh, the tutorials once again. And let's say that I have all the lectures on one day, like on Sunday, and all the tutorials on the other day. So this is how I get this timetable, which is great because I only have to wait for one hour and it's only I only need to be there to be there two times I can handle the being two times in college um, so that's it 
um, notice how it took us like a few minutes to do it? And that's like the example that I built. I knew how to do it uh, to get the best timetable. But think what it would take for you to do that with 10 courses. You'd play again and again and again, it, and it's time consuming. So I was like, I have to do something you know, better than trying this on my own. I know what I can do. I'm a programmer. I can program my own timetable generator. Yes. And so like every good student, I started with recursion because this is what I knew at the time. So I was like, okay, I'm going to use recursion to solve my problem. And so before I'm going to tell you how I did it, let's define our problem first. So this is a constraint satisfaction problem. What it means is we have constraints and we have a solution. A solution is one that answers one or more of the constraints, and the best solution will be the one that answers all of the constraints in the very best way. And this is what I wanted. I wanted to have the best timetable. And so I tried to do it, like I said, with recursion. What it means is I took a very classic um, recursive algorithm, which is called backtracking. And backtracking, what it does, it it goes through all possible solutions and it searches for the very best solution. And it worked great for two courses, no problem right there. But then, when I inserted more and more courses, the answer never came back. And so a quick calculation suggested that I might even have to wait two and a half million years <laughs> to get the best timetable. And so I was in a bit hurry. I didn't have that kind of time. I was like, I don't know, two and a half million years. Mm, I think the semester is about to start. I needed to revise my strategy. Maybe I don't need the best timetable. I mean, okay. Maybe a good enough timetable is just good enough. And this is what I did. I looked for a good enough timetable. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about evolutionary computation. So let me give you a little bit of background before uh, we move forward. So the theory of natural selection suggested that the plants and animals that live today uh, on this planet right now are the result of millions of years of adaptation to the demands of the environment. It means that at a certain point in time, a lot of different organisms are fighting for limited resources that the environment has to suggest. And those organisms who are able to get more resources, they will be able to have more descendants. And so their qualities will move forward to more and more um, newer individuals. And this is why it's suggested that those individuals are considered fitter than other ones who didn't manage to get enough resources to reproduce. And so evolutionary computation, what it does is it just takes it um, into an algorithm that is based on this very specific idea. And today I'm not going to talk about uh, evolutionary computation in general. In fact, just so you know, there are four Historically, there are four paradigms, which kind of, you know, that's a game of words right there. Why is, how is that even different things, right? But it's different things because it's different ways to represent the information in your algorithm. And today I'm going to focus solely on genetic algorithms. So, yeah, let's talk about it. Genetic algorithms. Okay, this is the flow of the algorithm. That's it. That's super simple to understand, it's not that simple to implement, but we'll get to this later. Um, so that, let's talk about the flow in general, and then later on I'm going to dig deeper for each step of this um, algorithm. Okay, so the first, um, first point. We're gonna have to start with generating an initial population. What it means is that we need to decide what a solution is. Like we, we decided that a timetable is a solution. And then, after we decided what a solution is, we need to generate a set of solutions. And those set of solutions will be considered a population. 
After we generated an, an initial population, um, we will have to assess uh, the grade of each solution. We want to determine how good a solution is. And we have to determine that for each and every solution in our set of solutions, I mean in the population. And so after we assess the grade of each solution, what we want to do is we have the selection, crossover, and mutation, which all together are called the reproduction part. And this part talks about the way um, you take the existing solutions and you create new solutions out of those existing ones. It means that this is the part where you create the next generation out of the current generation that you already have. And we have this done point. Done means that you either decided to let the algorithm run for a certain amount of time or you can uh, decide that you want to let the algorithm run for a certain amount of generations. Like I said, if you have a set of solutions and then you reproduce a new set of solutions, that this is called a generation. So you can decide that you want to have, let's say, 20 generations. And this specifically depends on your problem. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. It doesn't always mean, like, if you let your algorithm run for a longer time, it doesn't always mean that you'll get better results. And we'll see that a little bit later. Okay, I think it's time for us to go to dig deeper, step by step, into the algorithm um, with the timetable world. Okay, so we're going to start with generating the initial population. So please notice that it's number instead of names of courses. It, it just worked better for this slide, so forgive me for that. You know, just each, each of these numbers represent a specific class. So what we have over here, like I said, we have different solutions, a set of solutions all together. This is what makes a population. And the way I generated the initial population was randomly. What it means is that I had a list of courses, and out of these list of courses, I randomly chose a class, and I inserted it to a timetable. This means that I made sure that I won't create uh, an invalid timetable, because the only invalid timetable for my problem is one that has a course missing, or if it has the same course twice at the same timetable. Every other possibility considered valid for me. I mean, if there is a clash, if there, all of it is just clashes, if there is a, a huge gap, if I have to be there uh, like six times a week, it, it's, it all goes, it's all okay. But because later I will handle it in the fitness part, we'll talk about it. But here in this specific step, the only invalid option is if a course is missing or if I have it twice. So what I did, I just made sure that uh, if I got such a random timetable, I just um, threw it away and just redid uh, a new solution. So when you generate the initial population, like I said, you want to determine the size of the population. How many solutions will be one uh, population, one generation? So I chose to go with 100 because it was enough to cover um, much of the search area that I had, but it wasn't too much in order to get my algorithm to run too slow. So this is something that you want to consider. Don't make your, the size of your population too big um, because, I mean, it could affect the performance of your algorithm. Okay, we have the set of solutions. Now we want to determine what is a good enough solution. I mean, that's the whole point of this thing, right? So this is what the fitness function is. It's an evaluation function. It means that we evaluate each of the solutions and we give it a grade. So my fitness function was a weighted function. It means that I had weight for each of the constraints and this is, uh, this is what gave me the opportunity that if later in the future I will have more constraints, then I will just be able to easily add them in to my function. And I considered each of the weights to be a penalty. And this is why I went with lower is better in terms of grades. 
let's say that I have more days for a certain timetable, it means that it, this timetable will have a higher grade. Let's take a look at an example and see what I mean. So we'll start with the first um, constraint. It's the most simple one. Amount of times that I have to be in college uh, times the um, penalty. Simple timetables. I have to be there twice. My penalty was 10. And so the grade for this specific constraint for this specific timetable is 20. And that's just the first constraint. Right? I mean, now what we want to do is to move forward to the other constraints and see what the grade will be. So the next constraint that I'm going to consider is the gap between classes. Uh, remember, I said I don't want to wait more than two or three hours. No, I don't even want to wait three hours for a class. Never. I mean, so if we have this timetable, which I have a lot of time to wait, I want it to have like a worst grade. So this is why I still gave it the same penalty as amount of days, because for me that was kind of the same. If I have to be there for another day or if I have to wait for a long time, for me that it, it had the same weight. Um, and so the grade for this specific constraint, um, for this specific timetable, uh, it was 50. And if we sum it all up, the grade will be 70, because we don't have any clashes at all. Um, and we only have to be in college two times a week. And maybe, OK, I'll have to wait for a few hours between classes. So let's see another example. But this time, I want to show you one with the clashes constraint, because this is the one, I don't know, who confuses people the most. Um, so OK. Here, I have a timetable that it's all clashes. I mean, it's, it's a good timetable. I can just, you know, squish it all in, just be there twice. No, I don't even have to wait for anything. That's a great timetable. But, I mean, not really. I don't need an algorithm to just put everything together, you know? So that's why this specific um, constraint, I gave it a higher penalty. Because I do want to have the option of having some clashes, but... If something like this happens, then I want it to have a really, really like high grade. So I will know that it's a worse timetable than others that don't have as many clashes as this one. And so remember how we got before for, again, we had two days and we only had a grade of 70. And here, just for this constraint, this timetable is already at 100. And if we sum it all up, it's 120. And this is the way uh, you want to put your, the weights in terms of what is more important for you out of those constraints. Give it a higher um, penalty. So this is it. That's the fitness function. Um, if I would ever had any more constraints, I would be able to insert it uh, very easily to the function. And it means that now what we did is I graded each of the solutions of the population. So after we grade the solutions, what we want to do is we want to do the selection, the crossover, and the mutation, which is the reproduction part. OK, now stop thinking for just a moment about timetables. I know you're all super eager to know what happened. But consider this population. Um, so if, you have, if we have this population, we want to generate another population out of the existing ones. And how we're going to do it is we're going to start by selecting uh, parents. Um, and after we select two parents, we will have their baby stormtrooper. And then what we want to do is we want to select again to other parents. And I mean, sometimes uh, you can either, either make sure that you don't rechoose the same parents. Uh, what I did is I let it happen. I didn't care if I rechoose um, if one of the timetables was already a parent, because um, sometimes I had such good timetables that I didn't want wanted it to have different um, 
possibilities with other ones. But we'll talk about the timetables again just in a, in a second. Let's go back to the stormtroopers. So we do that. We have another stormtrooper baby right there. And we're going to repeat this process until we have the same amount of, of solutions like the previous generation. So what we have is this is the new population. Uh, this is the previous uh, population. And what you see over here is two generations of solutions. And so, like I said, you want to repeat the, reprodu the reproduction part as many times as um, the size of your population. But you don't have to. I mean, you can also decide that you want the population to grow uh, with every generation that goes or, you know, the other way around. You want it to uh, be like a smaller population. It really depends on how you do it. Okay, let's dig deeper into each of the steps. Selection. This is the part where we have the population and we choose the parents uh, for the next generation. So... The way I chose to do it is with roulette wheel selection. And roulette wheel selection um, gives the chance for all solutions to be chosen. But not all solutions will have a fair chance to be chosen. Better solutions will have a better chance to be chosen, and you know, worse solutions will have a lower chance of being chosen. But they all get a chance. This is how I don't lose possibilities. So for the sake of the examples, uh, again, I gave it like nice grades over here. It's not the real grades that I had for the timetables. Um, and so let's say we have the population. Each of the solutions is graded. And after I normalized the results, what I did is I just randomly chose, a, a, like, I randomly selected a number and this represented which timetable I'm going to use as a parent. And there are many ways to do the selection part. Again, it really depends on your uh, specific problem. So crossover. We have the parents from the selection part. Now we want to create the baby stormtrooper. Okay, I'm going to stop saying baby stormtrooper. I just, <laughs> I don't know, I think it's funny. But okay, <laughs> let's go back to the timetable world. Um, okay, so we have... Uh, two parents of timetables. I chose to use one point crossover, which means if I have two timetables selected as parents, I'm going to slice them um, actually in the middle because this is what worked for me. And I wanted to have half of the timetable to come from one um, parent and then the other half to come from the other parent. And here, I want you to know that if I got an invalid timetable, and remember, I said that invalid timetable is one that I have a course missing or if I have the same course twice in the same timetable. So the way I dealt with it is if I had a course missing, then I went back to one of the timetables and I randomly took it from one of them. Because remember, I did not have any invalid solutions before. So this course was probably there and I probably just missed it because of the um, crossover. Or if I had the same course inserted into the timetable, again, I randomly chose just one of them. And this is how I was able to not have invalid solutions after the crossover part. And it's very important because any other thing that you might think as invalid, like clashes or um, gaps or more days, it's not, it doesn't make the solution invalid. It just means that I will handle it later on at the fitness step. Okay, this is my favorite part of the algorithm. <laughs> and again, stop thinking about timetables. Uh, zoom out of this amazing world of classes and courses and come with me to play a genetic algorithm game. Yay! <laughs> so this is a great, great, amazing game by uh, Kiwan Donegard. Um, search for it online. I loved play playing with it. So geeky. But it's, it's actually great to really understand how genetic algorithm works. And what you see over here is a frog. And what 
this game is doing is it takes this frog. This is a solution. If we have many frogs, remember, this means that we have a population. All of these frogs, we'll see it in a moment, they will try together to jump, or not together, like each one of them is going to try to jump as fast as they can, as further as they can. And this is how they're graded according to the, like how high they can jump and how further they can get by jumping. Let's see a quick video of, of those great frogs. Just hope it will work. Yes, it works. Okay. That's, that's frogs right there. And they're all together. They're trying to jump. That's the first generation. And what you see over here is that they, each of them is trying to jump jump a bit further, like I said before, and in a minute, like in a few seconds, we'll see, there you go, you see the fitness of generation number 12. So for those of you who can't see, it says 14% fitness for this um, specific generation. And so we have generation 13, we have 14% fitness, and when we move forward to generation number 23, this, look what's going on. They're jumping together. And now if I'll go back and look at the fitness, we're at generation 23 and it was still 14% fitness. So this is generation 25. This had 14% fitness. Also, that's the same fitness that I had at generation 12. And those are many solutions together, those like solutions, frogs jumping together, which means we got to a local maximum. Because what I did is I inserted zero mutation. And so my algorithm was not, not mine, the game's algorithm was not able to evolve anymore. Look at them, they're all together. And what was missing is mutation. Let's take a look again at this wonderful game and see what happens when we do have mutation. So we start the same way we started before. They're scattered around, making their way, little froggy life. Um, and we, ha we have fitness uh, 13 at generation 12. And now when the video will move a bit forward, at generation 17, we had 17% 17 fitness. And now, if I'm going to spoil it up for you, if, it's, if we'll move forward to the next generation, we'll hit about 22% when it goes to 17 or it's to the eight, uh, 27 generation, we will already have, you see, 21%, which is way better than what we had before. We were stuck on the fitness of like 14%. And also... It's generation 28, and not only that the, fit, the fitness was much better, they're also super scattered. You see, we managed to avoid getting to a local maximum because I inserted, I inserted a certain amount of mutation. Now, what does it mean to insert mutation to this specific um, problem? So it means that I might throw in an extra random leg to any of the solutions or an extra muscle to any of the solutions randomly. And what it does is it inserts a whole new range of solutions that we didn't have before, that the algorithm was not able to evolve into just by the steps that I talked about before without mutation. And please notice, don't insert too much, too higher um, rate of mutation because it, your um, algorithm might go just, you know, wild card. It, maybe it will never converge into a specific solution. So you got to be careful right there. Okay, I know you all super enjoyed the game, but we have to go uh, back to the timetable world and see how we did mutation over there. So, okay, we, let's say I have this timetable and I want to insert mutation. So what does it mean? It means that I will take one of those classes and I will just randomly pick another day for this class. So over here, we have the assembly uh, tutorial on Tuesday. If I go back to the list of courses, I will just take the other option. Um, and now, so okay, now I have it on Wednesday. And right, I got like a worst 
solution, right? But that's not the point. It doesn't matter if I get a better solution or not a better solution. The idea is to uh, expand the range of solutions that I have. So this is it. That's the reproduction part. Um, and actually, this is the entire algorithm. Yay. <laughs> Um, so I know you're all probably wondering, May, what happened in that semester? Did you graduate? Yes. Did you go to all the classes? No. Um, I just studied at home and I, you know, I got over with it and I went to work and that's it. But that was a great experiment for me. And the thing is that I used um, a great uh, API, and the link is actually in the presentation. It was an API for a genetic algorithm written in C Sharp, which caused me to start trying doing things with C Sharp. That was kind of weird, but it was okay. And then I thought, okay, I want to show you guys not just the idea of the algorithm, I want to also show you a piece of code. And this code is not going to be super um, complicated. It's actually very, very simple. And the reason I'm going to show you this code is because I want you to see how simple it is to get going with this algorithm. So we start with generating the initial population. And it gets the list of courses, which is the input of the, like one of the inputs of the algorithm. And the other input will be the list of constraints. And notice that I activate the fitness function with the constraints on the entire population, the initial population. And after we did that, I'm going to have to choose the amount of generations that I'm going to use. Remember, like I said, each time that I'm generating more solution, it means that I have a new generation. And so, Inside the algorithm loop, I'm going to go by the amount of generations. Um, so actually, in my timetable um, program, what I did is I, I went by either time or an amount of generations, because I wanted to have both uh, ways. I said, OK, if I get f faster to 50 generations, then that's OK. But if you know, I didn't get to 50 generations after a certain amount of time, I wanted uh, the algorithm to stop. So inside this loop, it's not that I think that you don't know what a loop looks like. It's just that I really wanted to, stay, to state that inside it, with this initial population, after it's graded already, then you do the reproduction part. And after you do the reproduction part, you activate the fitness again. So it means that if we look at the entire code, we have to start with the initial population, we do the fitness part once before the loop, and then we start the loop with the reproduction part. And fitness again, and again, and again. And at the end, we return uh, the last population that we have. Um, what I did also is that I took this population that I returned to the user, and I sorted it by the fitness, just so the user will have several options. Um, the ones that are graded better will be shown first. OK. After I graduated from college, I really, really wanted to try and implement genetic algorithm by myself. Because remember, I said I used an API. And this is how it started. I talked to my friend, and I was like, do you think that I have you know, eating problems? Do you think that I eat healthy enough? And she was like, uh, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you should do something about your eating habits. And I was like, that's a great idea. Let's create a diet planner. Yes, that's what we're going to do. And we gave it a nicer name. We called it the nutritionist because I didn't want to go on a diet. I wanted to have better nutrition. So that's what we did. We started um, by develop, we started to develop the genetic algorithm from scratch. Each of the steps, uh, we saw how to do them, uh, the steps, and then we truly understood the different effects of, the, of each of the steps on the solutions that you get. And I went with the same um, functions that I had before. Like for the selection part, I went with rule at will because this is what I knew. But then I noticed that I had a little bit of a problem of performance. 
And I had to look for a different way to do the selection part. Remember, the selection part is where you choose the parents that of the next generation. So what I did is I just changed it to tournament. And tournament selection the way, is super simple. This is how it goes. You have all of the solutions together. This is the big circles up there. And then what you want to do is to create a pool that are of solutions that are randomly chosen. And at the end, you'll return the very best solutions out of those randomly picked ones. So if we see, if we take a look at a quick example of code, um, that's, by the way, that's written in Node.js. My project was written in Node.js, uh, which was kind of cool to do. Um, so how you do the selection part with, of tournament, it means that we have the tournament array and we want, okay, we want to generate the tournament array, and what I chose is to do it very small. I mean, I wanted each time to have just a very small set of solutions being picked randomly, and then out of them, what I, after I have it uh, ready, like the tournament pool, I will return the fittest uh, solution out of the you know, randomly picked ones. So it means that sometimes I might get all four solutions to be really, really, you know, with bad grades. But it doesn't matter because later on I will random, randomly pick other solutions. So it will still give chance to all different solutions of being chosen. And it, it, it still worked okay. And it had a better performance than the roulette wheel um, part. Whew. Okay, that's, that's summary time. Let's go over uh, what I talked today. So the first thing is that you want to do is to define your problem. Um, then after you've defined your problem, define what a solution is. I mean, what is a good solution? What is the not so good solution? And this is how you should choose your fitness function. You want to have a fitness function that will represent good enough uh, all of your constraints or, or all of the things that you want to represent in terms of is it a good solution or not so good. Um, then later on, you have to decide what is an invalid solution. And it really depends on your problem. For some people saying that, you know, having a clash is between classes, that's okay. For me, I didn't care. So it really depends on you. And then later on, remember about the mutation and in general for each part of the algorithm, make sure, like, try different ways to do each part because you might get better performance or get better result. Literally, each part of the algorithm can give you better results or worse results, but you should try. Um, try to understand which one of the ways to do each part of the algorithm is the best one for your specific problem. And yeah, the last part is the most important part that I have to, you know, that's the, that's the best tip that I'm going to have uh, to give you. Have fun. Enjoy what you do. And that's it. Thank you for listening. If anybody wants to do that in closure, then I gave you the API right there. If you're crazy enough to do that in closure. So, yeah. 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 So at the beginning of my talk, I, I said that this is how I actually started. I tried to do uh, backtracking, which actually goes for all different possibilities. And I think that if I had like, um, smaller range of solutions, then it would be enough just to go to brute force and go and check all possibilities. But I believe that once it's too big, then you're going to have to do something that will give you something good enough and not the very, very best and go over everything because it's just going to be a lot of time consuming. At the end or for the backtracking one?
So actually, less, so when I did the um, like the timetable in with the genetic algorithm, it was just less than a minute, even. Even when I like ran it later on um, with Node.js, like I converted the the whole um, project to Node.js, I, it was easier for me than C Sharp. So um, even then, that was that was that quick, and for even for ten courses, that was super super quick. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. So for the nutrition, it was actually almost the same as the um, like the weighted fitness function, and the weights were for um, let's say okay. So the constraints were the amount of calories that you want to you want to eat per day, the amount of protein, fat, and I also inserted like a heuristic of if I have uh, green, you know, like a salad, uh, whatever. Uh, things that you insert which are healthier, they got a better point. So it was a mix of weight, weighted and heuristics for better, healthier food. Um, the way, I, I don't remember if I actually mentioned it, sometimes I forget to say the, <laughs> yeah, like the way uh, my nutritionist project was. So the input was the list of products that you had in your fridge. Um, you just typed in the name, and then I used an open source database to get the nutrition values of each of the foods. So let's say you inserted, like, I don't know, milk and tuna, fish, or I don't know, rice. And so what I did is I, I took the nutrition values of each of those, and then I calculated how many calories you should eat per day um, by your uh, BMI. It's like there's there are many like easy calculators calculators like that. And then what I uh, gave back is the list of products and how much of each product you should eat per day if you want to eat healthy food. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just, you know, at the end, I was like, yeah, I don't care about the nutritionist. I just went and I ate the pizza. <laughs> that's, that's the best algorithm right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. I can't see for the light. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So I did no, I didn't try. Yeah, I mean, so the reason that I went with like super simple um, projects is because I wanted to start experimenting with genetic algorithms. So I didn't go into you know trying to optimize even the different parts. I wanted to start simple and see if I get it work to work, you know. So that was my first goal. But that could be a good idea for later. Right. Oh, well, that's interesting. That's an interesting thing to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Uh, three. No more questions, and I think uh, that's it. Thank you, guys.